So Richard is an American explorer and author. And in 2002, he was the youngest man to become president of the prestigious Explorers Club. He is the host and executive producer of the Emmy Award winning television series Born to Explore with Richard Weiss, uh, which debuted in 2011 and can now be seen on American public television stations nationwide. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you, Richard. Hi, Cole. How are you? Good. I, I guess if you're, you're in Augusta, Georgia, so I, I should be saying uh, how you all do. What is it? How, are you, uh, how do you guys say how? how how y'all doing? <laughs> Not just you all, all you all. Y'all. <laughs> all y'all. Well, I'm actually um, calling from Connecticut. Uh, I'm in a virtual Explorers Club background right here. And uh, it was interesting, uh, before the call, we were talking about adventure. And I mentioned that I went to Costco and I put the mask on and the gloves and the goggles. And I actually got an, an adrenaline rush. So I never thought I'd be getting uh, sort of that level uh, of excitement from going just to a Costco, but we're in interesting times. Living on the dangerous side, huh? Living on the dangerous side. Okay, so let me um, share my screen with everybody. And uh, love hearing questions. Uh, you know, my relationship with uh, Aggressor, uh, they're a sponsor of Born to Explore, which is uh, my show. And uh, it's been interesting because, uh, let's see, do, we don't have a slide on there, do we? Uh, where are we? Oops. Let me go back. Uh, you know what? I'm going to... Uh, boy, you, you'd never guess that I w worked in media, right? <laughs> That's what we get for doing a practice run. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, I, I do these all the time. Okay. I'm ready to do it. Share screen. I see that sound is on there. Put that. See the awkward desktop there. Play from start. Okay. You know... Um, my relationship with uh, Aggressor is kind of interesting because um, I've had a lot of conversations with Wayne Brown that sort of have nothing to do with adventure and has everything to do with how one runs a company. And uh, Cole, you mentioned that I'm president of the Explorers Club. And one of the things that um, I've admired most about uh, the Aggressor operations is the customer service. So I've actually called up Wayne and said, Wayne, how is it that every time I grow on, go on an aggressor trip that people brag about how many aggressor trips they've been on? It's almost like a, a badge of that. And I've really come to the conclusion that it comes to customer service, that when you get somebody on the phone, you feel like they're giving it to you straight and you can trust them and, and they're not going to steer you the wrong way. So that's something that, that I admire beyond uh, sort of having really great dive trips and, and now safaris is that whole aspect of customer service. So thank you very much for that. Um, you mentioned I'm president of the Explorers Club and I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the Explorers Club. It's a 116 year old organization started by some Arctic explorers. And uh, it's, it's afforded me very interesting opportunities. This is me speaking last year at the UN. Um, you know, last, uh, uh, year at our annual dinner, we had all these Apollo astronauts. We had eight of them, eight Apollo astronauts at the event. And some of the stories you hear at the Explorers Club are just unreal. Um, for example, the, uh, uh, let's see, one, two, three, fourth guy from the left um, uh, named Al Warden, he just passed away, but he told a story to me when we were uh, in a taxi going someplace how uh, when he was coming back from the moon, he was afraid they'd have a similar situation to Apollo 13. So on his own, he decided to do celestial navigation just out of his spacecraft window back from the moon to earth. And I thought to myself, you know, who, who tells these kind of stories? So those are the kind of stories that you hear at the Explorers Club. You have the Jane Goodalls, you have the Jeff Bezos, I like to say that I was getting Amazon Prime Prime. But, uh, you know, explorers don't necessarily start with a medal around their neck or going on uh, wall dives. They start all someplace. And my place where I started was Long Island, where people have beers and they go to the library and they were scared of people. But uh, beyond the, the horrible accents, I grew up on the Stony Brook Harbor. And uh, it's, if you're looking at that map of Long Island on the bottom, it's about uh, halfway in the island 
on the Smithtown Bay. And when I grew up, there were a lot of farms, a lot of empty areas, not many kids, but man, it was great for adventure. Um, I started actually diving, uh, scuba, uh, snorkeling for lobsters off of, you see that middle picture, you see some boats and docks, those are the Stony Brook docks. And I, I would just put on a, a kitchen -y, a glove, a rubber glove and put a mask on and, and stick my nose under rocks and try to find lobsters or I'd wander through the woods with my dogs. And, uh, you know, we would go fishing. We just, it just seemed like I could go anywhere and do anything. I used to start fires on the beach and cook fish that I caught. And uh, I was also lucky to have great mentors. Uh, my father uh, was an airline pilot with Pan Am, so he afforded us uh, some really interesting travel. I have a favorite uncle still alive, who's an MIT professor. Um, I had a, a conservation officer and a marine biologist named Steve Ressler, who when I was uh, 16, I think he dated one of my sisters for about five minutes, but he used to take me diving on all sorts of projects. In fact, uh, I helped him just to a small degree uh, put the first um, uh, artificial reef in the Long Island Sound. And uh, the place that I really think that my uh, sort of lust for uh, adventure started was when I was 11 years old. This is uh, the 11 year old me, and this is the start of Mount Kilimanjaro. I've been there, uh, I believe I've climbed it 14 times uh, over about a 50 year period. And uh, this is a little clip of uh, a Born to Explore episode with uh, talking about it with my father. I was only 11 when I first climbed this mountain with my father, an airline pilot. He was the first man to solo the Pacific Ocean in an aircraft. It was my dad who gave me my love of adventure. Dad, I, I can't believe how young I look there. I can't believe how young I was there. <laughs> Dad, what made you decide to bring an 11 year old to climb Mount Kilimanjaro? Well, I used to fly over the snows of Kilimanjaro and I thought, what a great adventure to take you on. I don't know, <clears throat> whoops, I don't know what my father was thinking, but uh, 11 years old on Mount Kilimanjaro, and uh, I hope someday to take my kids. But when I look at them, I have two 10 year old boys and an 11 year old daughter. And I think, I don't know if they're ready because, you know, nowadays it seems like kids need snacks every 10 minutes and, uh, you know, they may not have Wi Fi there. Um, Cole mentioned that I'm also um, host and executive producer of a TV show called Born to Explore. And uh, it's been a fantastic journey. In fact, uh, my other executive producer, Mercedes Velgott, who uh, Cole knows from our uh, Adventures Diving, um, is the person all the way on the right, uh, sort of pointing at things. And we travel around the world. And um, early on with Born to Explore, we decided that the two pillars of our show would be um, cultural understanding, and the other would be uh, why a, a good stewardship of nature is important. And um, you know, when you put a television show together, so many things go into it. Um, you know, it's not so dissimilar to planning a trip. Your pre-production and all the conversations setting up things are so important. And then when you get back, that, um, that idea of transcripts and, and edits and re-edits and edits and edits. But after uh, 200 shows, um, you know, we've been very successful. I wanted to show you uh, a short clip. And to me, this um, summarizes uh, that sometimes in travel, uh, some of your most memorable things were things you couldn't have possibly planned on. I'll give you the quick uh, sort of scenario. We're, we're gonna be talking to a horse whisperer. It's a guy who tells me I can, I can ride a horse that's never had a saddle on it in under two hours. This is about an hour into it, me breathing on the horse's nose, gaining its trust you know, all sorts of stuff. But what happened next has actually been seen now, uh, believed by uh, almost 200 million people uh, online. And I'll play that clip for you next. Hi, you, you want to cross that too? Okay, here we go. And... So what is the name of this beautiful horse? How se llama ese caballo? Este caballo se llama Charro Viejo. Name Charro Viejo. 
You know, typically when I meet a horse, it, it is not so calm like this. It's a very gentle horse. Es muy gentil, pero tratamos que todos sean así. This horse is very calm, but and we also hope that all of the horses are this calm. How is it that your horses are so calm when so many other horses are um, skittish? ¿Cómo es que todos sus caballos son tan tranquilos cuando la mayoría de tus caballos son un poco más eh, agitados? Yo creo que cuando a uno le gusta tanto este, este, este asunto, los mismos caballos le enseñan. Yo tuve varias lesiones jugando fútbol cuando era más joven en las rodillas. Uh, pretty funny. Um, you, Greg Harriet was the cameraman. What a good sport he was. But, you know, we love what we do. Um, the industry has recognized us. We've gotten 14 Emmy nominations, 37 tellies, Parent Choice Awards. Um, you, you're looking at Mercedes Velgot. She's in that uh, pinkish red outfit, uh, accepting one of our uh, Emmys with our crew. And, uh, you know, when you love something, uh, you, you don't feel like it's a lot of work. Okay, so I do have a bit of a diving experience uh, prior to uh, my trip with Aggressor. And it's mostly been, you know, junk dog type diving, you know, on crowded party boats that probably should be out in conditions they shouldn't be, going in through the surf, uh, diving off docks with uh, all sorts of stuff. My first buoyancy compensator, I think, was a life vest that I got off an airplane, all those kind of things. So when Wayne Brown said, do you want to go on the Cayman Aggressor, I had to think, hmm. That actually sounds like an interesting uh, way to travel. I had never been on a liveaboard before. I'd seen pictures of them, heard about them, heard about the company. And so for those of you who are watching who've never been on a liveaboard, it is like almost too easy. You feel that guilty. You're on this um, you know, well-appointed floating ship that has great views at all hours. You know, the Cayman Islands have sunsets. Um, you have you know, great food. Uh, you sort of get out of bed, you know, you fix your hair and uh, you go to the dining room and then your tank and everything and your wetsuit is right there. And for people who like to go on a lot of dives, um, I, 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 it's impossible almost to go on all the dives they offer. Um, you know, the Cayman Islands is an interesting place. It's uh, just south of Cuba. Uh, geologically speaking, it's uh, sort of in a rift area where two tectonic plates are pulling apart. I believe the deepest uh, recorded smokers underwater volcanoes are located there. It's over 5,000 meters deep. Um, it doesn't get a lot of runoff, which means the water is crystal clear. And opposed to other wall diving, it's within sight of land. So it's, it's a very unique place. Um, you know, when we first got there, it, you know, the sort of joke, why does the uh, chicken cross the road? Well, in the Cayman Islands, I guess because they can. That's sort of the first view. Uh, the Cayman Aggressor is uh, the Cayman Aggressor was just uh, beyond there, but uh, that's why chickens do. So uh, I spoke a little earlier about the Explorers Club, hearing all sorts of really wonderful stories about magic, and I, I believe that magic does exist, and so much magic exists underwater. And uh, you know, for someone like myself who doesn't go on that many um, really elaborate dive trips. Uh, this was just magic. I'd heard a lot about uh, how astronauts had trained out there. And I'm just going to show you a short clip of me following a hawksbill uh, turtle from a respectable distance and what it looked like from my eyes. And maybe the music adds a little to it, but that's at least what I had in my head.
know, the water really was that color. I mean, it was just stunning. So if you're um, sort of thinking about that idea of going on a dive trip, I, and I don't know how hard it is to get on the, uh, the Cayman Aggressor. When I was there, it seemed like it was constantly booked. But what a fantastic opportunity to experience magic. Um, you know, even the fish were friendly there. But what the uh, Cayman Islands, as I mentioned, ge geologically is known for are their wall dives. I had never been on a wall dive. And just before this trip, I talked to uh, Buzz Aldrin, who's a big diver. And he uh, was telling me that when they were um, practicing for the moon, going through a lot of the scenarios, they get a lot of time in the water, the idea of weightlessness. And so I had a lot of that in my mind. Um, I also felt on the aggressor that I had uh, dive masters and instructors there that uh, would let me experience things without really having to um, think about, uh, you know, they, they were, I, I let them think about the dangers and then I just followed their instructions and I could just relax in those things. So this is my first experience on a wall dive. If you've never been on one, I highly recommend it. As Aubrey and I hit the water, I'm suspended in the blue with a feeling of weightlessness. Surrounded by the silence of the ocean and the sound of my own breathing. At the rim of the Grand Canyon, that drops 5,000 feet. This drops 6,000 feet. Divers are known to flail their bodies at the edge of the wall. It's an unexplainable feeling that you will fall, even though you're suspended in water. It's an amazing feeling. Then suddenly, a shadowy form in the blue. Yes, the shark, the shark. The shark. The shark. It's a reef shark. Even though they're normally indifferent to humans, the sight of that dorsal fin makes my heart stop for just a moment. I decide to follow him. It might be a little deep for us. I'm at 105 right now. I'm getting too deep and have to turn back. But the thrill was unforgettable. I mean, to be honest, I wasn't that nervous of the shark, but I also started diving during the whole Jaws era. So, you know, you do have in the back, back, back of your mind, but what a fantastic experience it really was. I mean, it was so hypnotic. Now, earlier I had said that um, with Born to Explore, culture becomes part of the scenario. And I think when people think of the Cayman Islands, they don't necessarily think of culture. They may think of rum and uh, banking. And so uh, this is, um, uh, oh gosh, I just uh, drew a blank on his name, but um, Barefoot Man, Barefoot Man, there we go. Getting to be, have senior moments already here. Anyhow, so the Barefoot Man is a guy who does show up at sort of these rum infused parties. But you know, when I actually sat down with him, I found out this guy is an artist at heart. He does love where he is. He says he often goes out on the water and he just sang a little song for me. And, you know, I don't know, maybe I get more sentimental about these songs. But when I see someone who just really cares about where they live, it makes me smile. So I'll play a little different side of the Barefoot Man than maybe many people who go there would see. How can I express the place I love the best? I hope I'm laid to rest in the planet ocean. Oh, the endless tide of the sea in motion. I have found my home in the planet ocean. That was beautiful. How cool is that? You're sitting on the beach. I have to admit, I did actually have a glass of rum before I listened to him. Maybe that's why I got a little teary-eyed. I can't blame it on jet lag. But 
I, I just thought the guy was great. And so I, I do believe that when you go places, if you just take the time to look around, that even a place that seems that it wouldn't be infused with culture has it. So with that in mind, um, I wanted to do something a little more terrestrial adventure wise. And I found out that the Cayman Islands have uh, the rarest iguana in the world called the blue iguana. And uh, there's a place called the Blue Recovery Center. And their mission is to um, raise iguanas, release them in certain areas, and keep this uh, breed of animal alive. And so um, that will be our next clip here. Meet the most endangered iguana on Earth. It can grow to over five feet long and weigh 25 pounds. A giant dragon-like lizard with red eyes and a deep blue skin. Blue iguanas at one point were so rare that they were classified as functionally extinct. Perhaps only 20 of them left in the world. The fact that he is on my shoulder or on my head is a small miracle. The Blue Iguana Recovery Program has one mission, to save a species. Since 2002, it has taken a population of less than 20 to more than 700. But it took us 18 years of release to yeah. get to that number. Collecting their eggs, using incubators, that's how we save this beautiful animal. Who is this guy? Peter. Peter landed here a long time ago. This one is about 15 years old now, and we kept this guy here as a breeder. And he's a great breeder. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good quality to have. Um, and so, yeah, what, that guy, Alberto, what a great guy. Um, I, I really enjoyed meeting him. And it, it's nice every once in a while to, to hear a success story like the blue iguana. And so if you ever get to the Caymans, and you have the opportunity, it's, uh, it's very accessible uh, uh, from the uh, Cayman aggressor. The other area that we went to- Questions. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, Cole, go ahead. It's all right, you ready to answer a couple of questions coming in? Oh, absolutely. What would you say is your favorite place to travel with your family, since you have a couple kids? You know, um, we've actually traveled quite a bit. My wife is originally from South Africa, and so, um, we have been, my kids have been lucky enough to be, been on safari in her homeland of South Africa. They've been to France. They've been to all sorts of places. But the areas that I enjoy the most with my kids, and we do it where we are in Connecticut, and we do it in Cape Cod, is I love going out at low tide, and uh, we call it tide pooling. And you go out there, and there's no rules. Just be respectful to anything that's living. And that idea of being on a, on, a, on a tidal flat, looking at little forms of life, maybe building a sandcastle or playing with something, I just find that, that one hour that it occurs so magical. And so you can say, oh, go far afield. But I think anytime you're with a family and you see your kids are engaged or happy with something, that's very satisfying as a parent. You know, sure, I'd love to take my kids to Sri Lanka or diving in the Cayman Islands. But I, I think as a parent, you're just happy with their engaged with wherever they are. So it doesn't have to be something wild and crazy. It's, it's just that idea of you infusing a sense of adventure or magic with them. So, uh, you know, we've taken some gr great trips, but sometimes local travel is uh, the most magical. Sure, all right. And uh, what, what would you say is uh, your next bucket list uh, adventure you're trying to do that you have not done yet? Do you have oh, one? well, Cole, I actually am saving that one for the end. I actually, that is my last slide. So I, I will, there's a lot of countries I'd like to go to. Um, you know, people ask me how many countries I've been to all the time, and I've never really uh, counted them because, you know, there's different variations. Have you been to the airport? Have you spent a the day there? Have you done this? And so to me, I, I try not to bucket list it that way. I try to think of experiences, but I've never been to Greece. I've never been to Greenland. I've never been uh, to a lot of the islands in the, in the uh, South Pacific. Uh, I mean, it's a big world. Do you happen to know out of how many countries you visited, roughly? How many? Uh, I'm sure it's over 100. I mean, my dad was an airline pilot for Pan Am. I remember when I was in college, uh, I used to be able to get on Pan Am flights for free. I had a card. I'd just show up. 
and I had a three day weekend and I took Pan Am flight one around the world. And I went New York, London, Frankfurt, um, was Pakistan, India, Hong Kong, Honolulu, uh, LA, back to New York. And I did it in 48 hours just to say I did it. Um, I sat in economy and there's just no way I could do that now. It would probably kill me, you know. So uh, that's something, again, it didn't cost me anything, but I used to just get on planes and go to Africa for the weekend. Wow. Uh, one last question before I let you get back to your presentation. Uh, Nancy says she's curious to where you came across the barefoot man in Cayman. <laughs> uh, he was pretty close to the beach uh, by the uh, um, aggressor. I'm trying to remember the hotel we stayed at while we were there uh, because he was playing at one of the hotels. So, I mean, we prearranged meeting him, but I really liked meeting the guy one-on-one. -on -one. I thought he was a really soulful guy. You know, you, you associate him with some off-colored songs and stuff that's slightly risque, but um, he really, I, I was impressed by him. I really was. I, I felt I got to know the real barefoot man. All right, well, we'll keep uh, asking questions here in this chat box, everybody, and we'll try to get to them later in the presentation. So, Cole, I'd mentioned that I've been on uh, quite a few safaris in my lifetime. Uh, you know, I, literally a hundred I've been on. So the idea of going on a safari or to a place outside of Africa was a little new to me. Uh, Sri Lanka, formerly Ceylon, uh, was something that um, I'd heard about, read about, I've often enjoyed Indian culture. Um, I, I like uh, exploring uh, different religious cultures. It's a Buddhist nation. Uh, they producer of some of the best tea in the world. They have stunning landscapes. They have all these um, different types of monuments around there. Uh, but it's also known for some incredible Asian wildlife too. So uh, just to give you uh, a little uh, context of where it is. It's like a teardrop at the bottom of India. It's tropical there. Uh, if you look at the larger map, you can see where the Aggressor Safari Lodge is sort of the top of Sri Lanka. And it's uh, situated to um, some national parks that are very uh, interesting where they have, uh, you know, uh, leopards and elephants, Asian elephants. And so I thought it was, um, again, a pretty nice place to be. Uh, it, it was very similar in feel to an African safari camp with uh, a distinctly different cultural twist. One of my favorite Disney animal things was the Monkey Kingdom, and that was filmed in Sri Lanka as well. We made arrangements to go there and, and film. The, the person who runs it, his name is Wolfgang Dittis. It's the largest, I'm sorry, not the largest, the, the longest running primate study in the world. You see him sitting there with Jane Goodall. And if you've seen the movie, um, it's just such a wonderful juxtaposition of, of these um, uh, uh, Tuk Makak uh, monkeys going through some of these abandoned um, ruins. So uh, I'll show you our little uh, Monkey Kingdom filming. Um, again, he'd taken us through his studies. He identifies each one by their marking. And uh, I always find when you have animal sightings, with great experts, it brings it to such a, a, a different level of enjoyment. If you're with the right guide, an anthill can be the most fascinating place. So you can imagine be with one of the foremost uh, primate specialists that that would be good as well. Amidst the grandeur of these stone relics live the monkeys known as tope macaques. Curious and intelligent, they are perhaps most famous as the stars of the Disney documentary, Monkey Kingdom. I'm here to meet Dr. Wolfgang Dittes, one of the world's foremost primate experts. His work with the Smithsonian Institute began in 1967 and continues for over five decades. So did you think you'd be here 50 years? I mean, I really wanted to study communication in these animals, right? Now, if you walk into a group of monkeys, there's a lot of, a lot of communication going on. And what really threw me initially was there's sometimes they get into these screaming belts. Everybody's chasing everybody, screaming, biting, hollering, and making facial gestures. Sounds like my family. <laughs> exactly. And the most common behavior that I notice 
and I'm no monkey expert, is that you notice grooming. Like ladies have a, a tea club, you sit around and you gab and you the gossip over a cup of tea, monkeys do the same. That's all part of the social networking, it's sort of a social expression as to who's who and who gets favored and who does not. Sometimes this hierarchy within the groups can lead to aggression. Jamuza, the alpha female, was bitten by the alpha male, and the other males come to her rescue. I'm getting stressed out just looking at this. I don't like conflict. No, this is great. This is great stuff. This is this is music to my ears. This is great. Yeah, yeah, I see. Oh wow, this is getting really strong now. This is really getting strong now. Look, he's wow. in between the female and the male now. He's taking the lead role and being aggressive towards him. You see. And he's back, and the alpha male is backing off. Now you see the kind of cloak that the alpha female has, that the queen has here? She calls for help, and the other males come and support her. And now the two males are chasing her away. They're saying, hey, okay, enough of this fighting. Enough of this. And now the two females are ganging up against the one male. And he's biting her feet. Oh, this is getting really good. <laughs> I have to admit, I was getting stressed out watching these monkeys. He's sitting there, you know, and because he knows them all by a name or identity. And it was like a soap opera. I mean, this happens in, um, in wildlife. I remember being in Antarctica and I was around a, a, a penguin rookery. And all these penguins did all day was try to steal each other's pebbles because there's not a lot of loose pebbles there. And again, I was getting so stressed out because it seemed like all they did is peck each other and fight all day. So anybody who thinks that nature has this perfect harmonious world where they're all sort of walking hand in hand, hasn't really spent any time in nature. I want to show you this other clip because I think that um, one of the, the, the great technological advances is anybody's ability to film something at a, at a fairly high level. This was actually this next clip shot with an iPhone 8. I had a little hand, stabilar, stand, hand stabilizer on it. And, and this is the kind of video clip you can do. I don't need to practice, let's just do it. I think I was, uh, I don't need to practice. <laughs> I didn't even realize that was on there. So often when we do you know, things to camera, uh, Mercedes Velgott, who's uh, the executive producer, she go, well, what do you wanna talk about? She goes, you wanna tell me first? And that's her way of saying, oh, you should probably practice what you're saying. And I'm saying to her, I don't need to practice. Let's just turn on the camera. Let's just start talking. Uh, a lot of our stuff um, is uh, sort of spur of the moment, in the moment, uh, unscripted. And uh, I think that's a, a nice way to work. So one of the other things that Sri Lanka has, it has the largest population of wild Asian elephants. And, um, Asian elephants are much different than um, African uh, elephants, especially temperament-wise. They're not nearly as aggressive. They're smaller. And in Sri Lanka, it has the largest population of them. And so the next clip is we go to Kadula National Park, and uh, we, we go to see wild elephants. And for people who've been on safari, think about the most elephants you've ever seen in Africa. Maybe you've seen two dozen. If if you're lucky. So uh, this clip, you'll see a little different scenario. Sri Lanka is about the size of West Virginia, yet it's a wildlife hotspot in Asia with 16 protected national parks. We're just about to go into Kadula National Park. This area is known to have the largest concentration of wild Asian elephants in the world. What's special about Kadula National Park? Kadula, one of the biggest kedar you see in Asia, as you know. So uh, sometimes you see like easily two, three hundred elephant in one ground. So how do you become a famous because of that? So that's incredible. We see about 50 there, about six behind us. Yeah. I think I could look at elephants for hours. Do not have that many places in the world where you can see wild elephant this close, this big herd. So that's this must be the main reason why we should protect these elephants. How do they prevent the conflict between uh, needs of humans and the need for animals to have big spaces? So as a Buddhist, so we, we respect those animals' life 
same like human being so uh so we we shouldn't disturb them we should let them to enjoy their world that's a, that's a great attitude to have i think that was amazing i mean we uh oops screen um seeing that many elephants in one spot and you know in africa when you come upon a really good spot often you see a lot of safari vehicles showing up in the same spot that wasn't the case there you could see um we, there were two vehicles we were traveling and see the other one behind me i mean just elephants everywhere you have great sunsets um what was especially um heartwarming for me was that uh, shot on the top right and that was an asian elephant he was with a herd of elephants and then some local cattle were walking by and you know he just started walking with the cattle so sometimes when you're you're out in the wilderness um you can see some of the most amazing sights so uh sri lanka was great um i found it to be sell uh safe i thought it was culturally interesting i thought the safari lodge made me feel uh, a sense of romance of, of being out there. And so I know for um, a lot of you, um, you know, Sri Lanka might sound like some place that's maybe a little too far off the grid. I, I would really rethink that. I, I think it's, it's a fantastic destination and it offers uh, so much. In fact, um, one of our producers who originally introduced me uh, to Wayne Brown, uh, John Michaels, I believe he took his family there. He went there with his wife, and I think he had a, a, a similar uh, experience. So, uh, Cole, you asked me a, a question about um, what's on my bucket list. Yes. I have never seen a whale shark before, and the idea I've seen tons of pictures, tons of video. I know where they exist, and I know you guys go on them, but the, the idea of, of you know swimming next to something this big and this wild is something that captures my imagination some of the shark dives do too and that stuff but this is the one if you ask me what really excited me uh that's you know that particular uh creature that's something i'd like to see i can't blame you i can't blame you there um we do have some other questions coming in um, okay uh, can you talk a little bit about the lodge itself and the professional guides? Yeah, so um, I really can compare apples to apples or apples to oranges because I have been to dozens and dozens of safari camps. And so uh, I like the, the canvas tented experience. Uh, I don't like being in a, what I would call, um, a, a place where I don't hear nature around me. And so I think that at the... Um, Safari Lodge in Sri Lanka, it, it had the right blend to me. You know, I like to eat nice food. I'd like to have a dining table where uh, you'll sit and regale the day's uh, events and have a nice hot shower. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But yet I felt um, it, within that camp, I didn't feel like uh, there were too many other uh, tents too close to me. I didn't find that uh, I could hear outside civilization. I felt safe in there. So I, I think it ranks, um, you know, pretty high with some of the African safari places I've been. Uh, you know, it's definitely different. I mean, because you're, you're in a different part of the world and it, it, it does have some of that cultural infusion. Um, I think that the, the guides there, for the most part, were uh, knowledgeable. Uh, you know, it's, sometimes it's a little catch can on guides. You know, some guides are going to be better and connect with you differently. But I think if, you know, I think it's a, a little incumbent on people to be sort of um, open to cultural nuances that you might get with guides. So I thought the guides were, um, yeah, they were fine. They stacked up um, well. I think that uh, the one thing I've found just from these two uh, aggressor trips, there was a consistency of product. And I think that's important. I think that uh, as a traveler, you want to know, uh, even though I, I like having adventure and a little of the unknown, I, I like the idea of the consistency of, of service that you know that at the end of that phone line or internet or whatever it is, there's somebody who is tracking your trip. Okay, that's a good answer. Um, <clears throat> we don't have a question here, but we do have a, a shout out. Someone that you met at the Safari Lodge is in this group of 50 that we've had today, Elaine Ngoli. 
Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hi. How you doing? You know, and that to me is one of the great things about travel is the people aspect of it. And um, everybody always thinks, oh, the most memorable aspect uh, of a trip will be going on a wall dive or maybe going with a whale shark. But ultimately, it's the people you meet along the way. And um, I found that on the dive boat, you know, people sat at their sort of distinct uh, tables at the beginning and were a little, you know, guarded. But at a certain point, everybody's seen each other taking outdoor showers there and stripping their stuff off. And it sort of breaks down a lot of that stuff. So um, I like the idea of being in an uh, encampment where there's enough people to where you're going to always find somebody interesting, but not so many to where you get sort of get lost in the crowd. So that's something that I, I enjoy a lot on, on these trips. Right. Right. She said she enjoyed uh, sharing stories and adventures over dinners with you guys. I, I hope she thought I ha we have a, a well-behaved crew because um, I know that Mercedes was with us and she sort of, <laughs> really demands that guys uh, treat every place like it was uh, better than their home because I know how some of these guys live. Um, so our, our, our group tends to be uh, curious and, and polite. So um, it, it was mutually um, communicated, I think. Um, our buddy John Michaels is in, in here. Oh, John Michaels, the songwriter, John Michaels. Right. And John asked, what was it like to dive with a full face mask versus the mask and regulator? John, I'm glad you asked that question because um, that was a little challenging. Uh, I've seen in the past, uh, I think Anderson Cooper was trying to do some sort of diving and uh, with a full thing, because you, know, you think that you're going to describe your surroundings in these poetic ways. And it's not so easy. It's a little bit of an acquired uh, skill to do the full face mask talking. So I thought that was a little bit of a challenge. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't mind it as much. I mean, there's a part of me that likes the bare basics because if I really think of my, my roots of the under, uh, undersea, it was just with a mask and a rubber glove and some fins. And so I, I know that a lot of divers can get very uh, equipment conscious and there's sort of like a pecking order. I'm a pr pretty basic guy on that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, Gracie wants to ask, um, of all your trips, which one would you go back again in a heartbeat? And which one was the most adventure challenging? I mean, I, I like revisiting spots. I mean, maybe, maybe that's why I've been to Kilimanjaro so many times is that there's, there's something about doing something better the second time. And I think a lot of divers can identify with that. Um, I'd like to go back to Antarctica again. Uh, I felt when I went there, uh, the camera equipment I had was kind of bad and, and obsolete and, and it was really beautiful. Never been to Greenland. I'd really like to see those hanging glaciers there. Uh, I know you guys have a trip on the Cocos Islands, uh, some sort of shark dive. And, and I've seen some amazing video from that and that looks really appealing to me. It looks kind of like Shark Island. Um, I would go back to Sri Lanka. You know, I definitely would go back to Sri Lanka because I, I felt that always by the end of these trips, you sort of are getting into the rhythm of a culture and, you know, you're just sort of getting it. And I think I would um, be within that culture a lot faster the second time around. Sure. And how do you go about planning your, your trips when you say, OK, now I want to go to Greenland? What, what's your process of getting everything figured out. Yeah, so that's a good question because it really comes from a combination. It comes from talking to people like yourself who will tell me about an experience or a neighbor or I'll read an article. I remember um, we were filming in Chile and um, I was just doing a Google search on some things there. And, you know, I like ports and fishing and, you know, those kind of things. And I, and I saw some horses that were pulling boats out of the water and I thought, wow, this looks really unique. I've never seen horses pull out fishing boats from the water because there's no docks. And then we did a little more research and we found out that the only professional fishing woman in all of Chile is in Horacon. And you know, that, that's sort of the process. I, it, it's either an image, word of mouth. I've, I've had neighbors say, oh, you should go like Oman. That would be an example of a country I don't know a lot about. And they'll say, oh, you know, and I'll, 
Oman has this, this, this. And, you know, I start s searching around. And then once you get to that point, then now you're looking for local experts who can help you plan it. And that usually falls more into on our trips uh, to Mercedes Velgott because the arrangements for a crew are a lot different than if you're just going uh, on a family trip. Um, we really, because uh, it's time and money and a different expectation of what we come back with. I'm not fully enjoying a trip until I know what I'm seeing is in a can. I'm always having in my head, okay, how many minutes of an episode will that make? How many minutes? So even on that dive trip, we're enjoying the moment, enjoying you know the, the, the nice dinners and stuff. I'm in, in the back of my head saying, okay, what are we filming tomorrow? What do we get today? How much of a show? You know, uh, we feel a big responsibility when when we go to a country that we're representing it well. You know that we're uh, being culturally sensitive to it. We're showing it off in as pretty a way as we can, and so there's a little bit of anxiety. Uh, before, uh, you know, we're happy on these trips. And then at a certain point, you say, okay, I know we have an episode. I know we have two episodes. I know we have three episodes. And then uh, you can relax a little more. But we're working very hard from sunrise to sunset to try to capture the best images we can. Okay. Um, we have one person asking, uh, how do you fund the TV show? Yeah, well, so there's different ways. So originally we were on ABC. Uh, born to explore and uh we had uh, uh our deal with abc at that time we would get paid based on advertisers and revenue and that comes with a lot of restrictions too and um our group and this might sound kind of corny in this day and age uh is very socially conscious we believe very much in the product we do and we felt that going over to pbs would give us um, a higher editorial platform to stand on. You know, you really don't see any bad shows on PBS. Uh, and we've been lucky since the beginning when we first signed with ABC, they were, you know, at that time, very anxious to get the show on air. And usually negotiations were over money. And I put a small clause in there that we had total editorial control. And uh, that's been the diff all the difference in the world. If you ask me why we win so many Emmys or awards, it's because at the end of the day, uh, I have a running joke with Mercedes where I say to her, do you want to be an A student or a B student? And, and the rest of our group always wants to be an A student. So when we put a product out, and you've worked with us, Cole, you know that um, we, we just don't like to put our, our face or name on anything then that's less than the best that we can do. Absolutely. Um, we do have one question here and I know you probably wouldn't even want to answer this one exactly, but it says of, of all the trips you've taken, is there one thing that you would say is overrated that you, that didn't quite meet expectations? Yeah. Let me think about that for a second. Um, you know, a lot of times, um, certain places are, they will almost think to be cliche like the grand Canyon or this. And in those cases, I don't find them to be cliche. I would say overrated would be, uh, see, I'm not that interested in, I've never filmed in, for example, like Las Vegas. It doesn't interest me that much. The area outside of Las Vegas might, because I think in the desert regions, some really wonderful places. So unless I'm doing something very culturally interesting in big cities, it's not that interesting to me. Um, but, you know, look, there's too many really great places to go to ever pick a bad one. So I, I would say, gosh, anything overrated? I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, I remember going to Disney uh, World with my family, and it was right when school let out, and every ride had about a two-hour wait. And that was a little overrated at that point. Not that I think Disney is overrated. I think Disney is a wonderful product. But any time that you're sort of forced into that kind of mass consumption, you know, the experience isn't as good as it could be. Okay, sure. Let's see, we got a few more. How many days of the year would you estimate that you travel? Right now? Ha! <laughs> I travel from my den to my living room to outside. <laughs> um, when we first started shooting Born to Explore, it was really tough because um, my wife had just had our third, second, third child, and we would go out in the field for about 
uh, anywhere between like 12 and 16 days. And uh, that was a lot of pressure on my wife because now you have three kids under two at home and I'm off, you know, seemingly having a great time, you know, elsewhere. Uh, that was a, a tough sell. There were many times I came back exhausted from a trip and she'd just throw three kids on my lap and, and walk out of the house. But um, sure. we, were, we were going about two weeks uh, in the field and then I'd say two months uh, home. And to me, that, that's not, uh, you know, it's not so much. Even, you know, with my dad being an airline pilot, he'd go away on trips, but he seemed to be home more than he was away. So uh, as much it, and in as many countries as we go, I'm probably home a lot more than I'm away. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if we got anything else. Is there anything you want to add? Well, I'm Mercedes Velgott and John Michaels, who work on this show, are in, in the audience. I wonder if they have anything to add there. And your big boss, Wayne Brown, I think I see his name up there. Wayne's in here, too. We could bring him in if... I, I, I will personally thank Wayne because, um, you know, you ask how we fund TV shows and PBS does not happen without um, people like Aggressor who fund them. And so um, Wayne is more than a, a sponsor. I, I like him personally. As I said, I, I've spoken to him advice on how to create better customer relations at the Explorers Club. And, um, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to do something like this. I believe in the product. I believe when somebody calls up aggressor and they get someone like yourself, Cole, or anybody else in that office, I've been there in Augusta, Georgia, that you're getting somebody who cares about the repeat business and not just selling a trip. And so that's something that in this day and age is very admirable. Well, thank you for saying that. That's uh, very well said for sure. Wayne says he would love to join, but he is hopping on a call as we speak. Yeah, as, as he always does. Wayne, Wayne has a, a cell phone attached to his hip <laughs> you or his head. Well, Richard, thank you for, uh, for your presentation. I thought it went great. And um, we had about, I think, 54 participants. Good showing. And we still have 42 in the, in the room. And I'm going to go ahead and read uh, our upcoming schedule, everyone. So okay. May 14th, we have uh, Welcome Aboard the New Philippines Aggressor with Wayne Brown and Aaron Lerman, the new owner of the Philippines Aggressor. On May 19th, uh, Ship Shape and Ready for Your Next Adventure of a Lifetime with the Aggressor Adventures Operations Team. On May 21st, uh, The Ish of Fish and How to Know Any Fish You Meet with Samantha Whitcraft. May 26th, we have Michael Richardson from Patty. And just added May 27th, uh, Captain Scott Arney from Palau Aggressor and the uh, Rock Islands Aggressor um, 2. So he'll um, Palau Aggressor 2 and the Rock Islands Aggressor, and he'll be talking about traveling to Palau. Well, that's it for now, everybody. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, Cole, you must be great at dinner parties. You're such a good host. <laughs> <laughs> getting used to them. I'm doing these all the time now. Yeah, that's right. Okay, bye. Thank you very much, Cole. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, bye. everyone. Stay safe.